Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Become a Guest to Apply. All right, so uh, I am thrilled to welcome back Ron Corey, who is the best-selling author of Tenacity, but Ron is so much more. I mean, he's, he's an entrepreneur, a businessman, he's a, a veteran, um, long accomplished career. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Ron and, and, really, and really digging into uh, the book Tenacity and then also the book that we co-authored together. Um, he definitely brought some great content and Ron's also always a great guest bringing knowledge on the show. So first off, Ron, I just want to say, hey, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Adam. It's my honor and privilege to be here with you. Oh man, so uh, uh, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed our previous um, episodes and times working with each other, and I'm sure this will be the same. But uh, you you know the drill. We'll start this episode the way that we start them all with what we like to call our Mission Matters Minute. So, Ron, we at Mission Matters we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Ron, what mission matters to you? I think it's a twofold mission on, in my life. I, I try to seek happiness and help support my family and friends in every way I can, inspirationally and by example. And, and twofold, I like to share with people that don't know me that I've, I feel very lucky to have achieve, achieved the level of success I did in business, coming out of the Marine Corps, relocating across the country from New York, where I grew up, to Las Vegas, where where I ultimately chose to reside and to pursue various businesses, which started with one on a wing and a prayer and grew to 20 total businesses and, and share with people uh, a very simple axiom. You never hit the ball if you don't swing the bat. Yeah, that's great. And I, I lose I lose count. That's why I said when I said you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you have you've had a long career, and you've launched a lot of businesses. So uh, great to have you on. Um, and I think just to get us just to get us kicked off here, I don't want to assume that maybe some of our uh, our newer audience caught some of our previous work. So maybe just start off with a little bit more, a little bit deeper into your background, really as an entrepreneur and how you got started in business. Sure. I, I was a teenager in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. and as a result of the draft, I opted to enlist in the Marine Corps rather than be drafted into a random one of the services that the Selective Service Board would dictate. Yeah. I selected the Marine Corps because I was looking to be challenged. I was looking for the best training I could get because back in the early 70s, anyone who went into the military was going to Vietnam. So I felt the best training would enhance my likelihood of survival. Hmm. As it turns out, during my 90 days of boot camp and 120 days of advanced infantry training, hmm. the president at the time announced the escalation and troops were no longer going to be sent to Vietnam. Instead, they would be withdrawn. So instead of going to war, I went to Camp Pendleton and Barstow, California, which is how I found Vegas and what in 1973 was a very small town. I felt it was a town of great opportunity. So I made it my uh, home of residence. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, you're my, of course my phone's going to ring at the worst possible time. <laughs> it's okay. So that's uh, why we do them live. I'm, I'm, I'm working. We get phones, we get babies, we get animals. It's all good. <laughs> So I selected Las Vegas as where I'd want to live when my military mm -hmm. term of service ended. And in Las Vegas, I became a casino dealer, yes. uh, mainly because I had no training to be a lawyer, doctor, or any professional aspect mm -hmm. of a career. And I was good with numbers. I was ambidextrous, good with my hands. So mm -hmm. becoming first a blackjack dealer, and then a roulette dealer, baccarat dealer, and craps dealer, uh, became my pursuit for seven years. And as a result of enjoying the experience of being in the gaming industry, mm. I ended up wanting to own my own business mm. and seek my own future where if I worked hard, made good decisions, I didn't just get a salary, I could reap the rewards mm -hmm. of my good choices in life. And as I explored 
uh, different things. I worked as a realtor for several years mm -hmm. and exploring businesses and the acquisition of residential properties for my clients and for myself. I decided to go into the tavern business. Yeah. The tavern business ended up growing exponentially because a gentleman I grew to know named Cy Red mm -hmm. left a small company named Fortune Coin when he invented video poker, believe it or not, yeah. interactive gaming. And the people he worked for at uh, a slot machine company laughed at him and said, you know, gamblers, they, they just want to pull a handle, line up sevens. <laughs> they don't want to have to think. The thinkers are going over to the blackjack table and the dice yeah. table. So he opened his own company, Fortune Coin, which wow. became IGT, International Game Technology. Wow. The, possibly the largest manufacturer of slot machines in the world today. And uh, as a result, going into the tavern business, when a couple of years after I first got into that business, hmm. he invented video poker. And instead of selling drinks and, and chicken wings to generate <laughs> revenue, we became uh, gaming parlors. Yeah. People would go to their neighborhood tavern to gamble enjoy cocktails in a social environment yeah and the revenues that that generated were astounding mm. and and so that's how i started out in business but i i grew antsy i wanted more challenges mm -hmm. so as a result i i would explore my community try to determine a niche that wasn't being filled or i thought i could fill it better and and that drew me from from an initial growth of four gaming taverns into the limousine business, the printing business, the car dealership business, yeah. just to name a few. So I think what, what's super interesting to me about your background too, when you say something like video gaming, so, so for some of the people that are watching this right now, they're like, wait a minute, this didn't like, like, of course, like new technologies and you, as you said, getting kind of antsy and figuring out different ways to add value. Really, you're looking at ways to add value to your community and other people's lives, which is, you know, my opinion at the core of business. So, you know, looking at, I know, I know you stay kind of, um, I know that somebody like yourself doesn't stay still. So I'm, I'm just curious, what do you see just in general that comes across your deck? It could be technology, it could be business ideas, it could be otherwise, but what do you see that kind of excites you right now in the market? Like, what do you, what do you see in general? You know, having done so many different things that, yeah. that uh, of course my book will describe to your mm -hmm. viewers, but uh, I had to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. I mean, <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm, I'm, I'm 71 years old and I don't want to be retired. I want to find new challenges. And as I explore, I believe that, Ron, that's why I asked you the question. I, I, don't, I know you don't stay still. <laughs> Go well, ahead, please. <laughs> I, I chose, here's what I chose to do. I put a couple of years of effort into writing my autobiography. Yes. Got it, got it out, became an Amazon number one bestseller in the yeah. first year it was out. So looking for a new way to market it. I looked for a new voice because audiobooks were so popular. Yeah. And um, I actually have hired two different people. My yeah. first effort was with Michael Madsen, the actor from Donnie Brasco. Yeah. And after I felt like we explored that as much as we could for fans of his to listen to his speaking the words of my book, yeah. I was watching the news one morning and they had a guest on and it was none other than Dean Cain Superman from the Lois and Clark TV series in the 90s. And I found him to be incredibly personable. He had an engaging, real feeling smile mm. as he exchanged with the interviewer. And I thought, you know, uh, maybe my book hasn't run its last course. Yeah. If I had a new audiobook put out by a new uh, and very famous personality, mm that could give me something new to do with the book. Yeah. So uh, I found a way to reach Dean Kane in Los Angeles. We spoke, we struck a deal. I brought him to Las Vegas, put him up in a hotel, and we spent five days in a recording studio. I got to know him very well. We went to dinner every evening yeah. and yeah. We, we recorded my book. And now the audio book by Dean Kane is available on Amazon. And our, we, we struck such a friendship because he is a very honest and engaging guy. And I try to be also, we, we hit a lot of synergies 
And uh, it's been great fun marketing my story through Dean's voice. Yeah. And I'm very proud to say he, he, he enjoyed the encounter so much, not because of me, of course, yeah, but yeah. because of his desire to leave California and the taxation that comes with it. Yes, he moved yes. to Las Vegas this month <laughs> and is now a resident of Nevada. And I look forward to spending more time with him now that he's nearby. That's awesome. What a great story. And one of the things that I, I, I'm, I'm inspired by your story is, is the idea of kind of paying it forward through the knowledge. Like, so for example, when you were creating tenacity, there's a lot of different things you could have done with your time, of course, and there still is. And the fact that you spend time to the autobiography and like the stories and the things that you told within the book really is to pay it forward and to help others. Um, like what's your, what's your comments or any, or any comments on like why people should go out there and tell their story? Cause I know, well, at least in my experience, whenever I've seen somebody kind of on, you know, before they do a book, they have an idea about it, but then after it's out, after they get the feedback, that's usually a whole different story. Like, so now that you're on the other side as published and out there, um, like wh what's been your experience? Well, I hope to motivate and inspire others to reach their maximum capacity and, and take advantage of opportunity they may not realize is out there. I encounter so many people that think in talking to me, they may find the secret to success or, mm -hmm. or, or uh, find a way to overcome what they see as an obstacle in their life mm -hmm. to get out of their humdrum job and do something. Mm -hmm. and, and as I said earlier, you'll never hit the ball if you don't swing the bat. So in my mm -hmm. case, going back to your first question, I didn't have the money to purchase a tavern, but <laughs> yeah. I was a realtor and a dealer by night. Yeah. I sold a property for a fellow dealer mm. who, who had no, in, no plans for the money that he would receive as a result of the sale of this property. Yeah. And, and as it turns out, uh, the money that he was receiving from the proceeds of the sale was very close to what a tavern owner that I interviewed as a, on behalf of a potential client wanting to buy a bar. He was my, he was actually the boss of my blackjack pit where I dealt. Yeah. He wanted to buy a bar for his daughter to manage. She was a bartender mm -hmm. and for him to invest in. Mm -hmm. So I identify a tavern that I think is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy wanted 115,000 for it with 35,000 down. I didn't have that kind of money, but that never stopped me from exploring yeah. options. So lo and behold, as I'm contemplating, how do I raise this money to buy this tavern and work for myself? Yeah. I bring Jose Martinez, his proceeds check from the sale of his duplex, and it's $35,000. Come I mean, on. If fate was ever ringing a bell, <laughs> there it was. But once again, you don't find out what opportunity exists if you don't pursue it. So I brought Jose his proceeds check, which was my practice as a realtor, not yeah. have go go get it or wait for it to come in the mail. I would deliver it to them, shake their hand, congratulate them on the completion yeah. of the sale of their property. And as I did, and Jose was a fellow roulette dealer with me at the Tropicana. Wow. Uh, he he migrated here from Cuba after the Castro takeover and and became a dealer, which is what he did in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And we became friends. So I bring him his check and I ask him, what is, he, what is his intention with the proceeds? And he said, I don't know. I guess I'll put it in the bank. And yeah. I said, Jose, a bank's going to give you 5%. If you loan it to me, I'll give you 12. And yeah. he said, he said, you know what? Um, I really have faith in you. He said, when all the dealers, when we have our 20 minute break every hour, they go down and play gin rummy or tonk. And you go down and read a book. You're studying for a test. You're always doing something. Yeah. He said, I believe in you. I think you're going to do something. And, and I'm, I'm going to loan you this money. And, and I'm going to sit back and watch and see what you do. And, yeah. uh, of course, you know, he said, I'm happy to get a better return on my investment uh, in a passive form of return. He wasn't looking to do anything like I was looking to do. Yeah. And, and he signed the check over to me on the spot. What? And... Uh, I said, Jose, I'm going to go to an escrow company, get a trust deed on my home, you know, provide some security for you. And he said, Ron, if I didn't trust you, I wouldn't even be talking to you. He signed wow. the check over on the spot. I did the paperwork anyway, in case, God yeah. forbid, I got hit by a car. I wanted my estate 
to make sure he got paid back. Mm -hmm. But he loaned me the money. I ran down and 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 made the deal for the tavern. Uh, my buddy from the Marine Corps, Dan Hughes, and I had moved to Vegas together at the end of our service. Mm -hmm. And I offered Dan a percentage of it uh, to, to own it with me. We had done everything together through the Marine Corps and after. Yeah. So as partners, we purchased the bar. I would run it. He kept his business as a, as a printer of slot machine glass. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the first tavern, we were able to grow to... Four, four total taverns, wow. gaming properties, restaurants, and uh, three other businesses before um, I was looking to do something more. And Dan wasn't. Dan was pursuing retirement. Mm -hmm. And I, I found a great friend and business partner in Don Tamburo, and we got into the automobile dealership business together. Wow. And, and my growth continued from there. Man, what a story. And so in, in the book that we published together, so the title of your work was em Embrace the Roadblocks, Don't Give Up Before, and then you wrote a number, a number of different topics. So don't give up before you begin. Um, don't play the, the political or play the political game. Um, listen more, find the right people. And like this story you just told me, I didn't know that one about, about how <laughs> the first deal was done. I didn't catch that one. That's a, that's a good one because I, I feel like it's so... It's so easy for us, myself included, so I'm not, I'll pick on myself here, to look at somebody and where they're at or what they've done and to be like, oh, you know, like they, you don't, you don't always know the story behind how they got there. Like that yeah. first deal. And I mean, that the, the nuances of that first deal, when you talk about a sign, like, so nobody, you know, nobody gave you that. You weren't, you didn't inherit that. It wasn't like given to you that first deal. And then the amount of time and effort I know, um, um, is beyond the context of this interview, but I mean, like to go from one to four, like the countless stories, the hours that you spent to make that happen, because you also didn't at that point, I mean, you, you've been in the business, but you hadn't run your own tavern at that point. So it's still different. You've been in gaming, you've been in hospitality, but correct me if I'm wrong. You didn't, you didn't even run a tavern or anything like that at that no, point. No, I, I was a casino dealer. Yeah, that's right. I, I just, you know, I, I embrace challenge. I, yeah. I guess the best way to state it. And, and I try to not be dissuaded by obstacles. Hmm. So, so when a tavern became available and I didn't have the money, yeah. I just needed yeah. to find a way to overcome the obstacle. Yeah. And in that yeah. time in my life, Jose and that $35,000 was the way to do it. Now, of course I had a note. I had to make the tavern successful back in the day when you had to sell drinks, we didn't, that bar didn't even have a kitchen at the time. Dan and I put a kitchen in to sell food <laughs> And then once again, observe, embrace the challenge, overcome it, and, yeah. and, and fix the problem. So I watched customers come in for a couple of drinks and leave because they were hungry. Mm. And I said, Dan, we got people, they, we, our marketing work, they, we got them to come to our place, and we're losing them because they're hungry. So mm. uh, we didn't have the, the, the money to build a kitchen. We were living off the bar receipts, yeah. you know, supporting the families we were growing. So I had an aunt in Pennsylvania who I asked if she would loan me the money for a competitive rate of interest better than she was earning. Yeah. She yeah. loaned me $15,000 and we put a small kitchen in that I, I wasn't a cook, but I could deep fry chicken wings and French fries yeah. and make a salad. So those were the first items on, on our menu. We charbroiled burgers, deep fried chicken wings and chicken fingers and made fresh salads. Yeah, and yeah. I no longer lost my businesses to people that that were leaving to go get food. Now they stayed even longer. They gambled longer. They yeah. drank yeah. longer, and and that bar we were able to parlay it into more. Um, you know, talk about challenges. When I when I identified that the limousine service in Las Vegas was truly horrible, mm -hmm. you know, there uh, believe it or not, this boom town people consider. Yeah. The town only had six stretch limousines among the two existing limousine companies. Wow. Mostly they were formal limousines, which yeah, are just yeah. slightly stretched to run people from the airport to the hotel. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was a market in the truly specialized stretch business. Yeah. And, and the drivers, my competitors' drivers, were in a baseball jacket and baseball cap. 
I put drivers in tuxedos. I bought only stretch limousines. I stocked the bar. Yeah. They, these, these other limos had bars, but it was just a bunch of wood. They didn't even put bottled water on the bar. So <laughs> we, we raised the bar by doing things different. And presidential limousines grew to astounding heights. And mm -hmm. when the time came that my competitor wanted to meet me, I didn't know why, but he wanted to buy me out. Wow. So we negotiated a price and, and I parlayed that into doing more taverns that we could buy the land and build our own building, a dream Dan and I always had. Wow. And, and yeah. So, and then we had a car wash, by the way, when we had the limousine company, we were getting what back when car washes cost two ninety nine to do, mm -hmm. to ro roll through the car wash, mm -hmm. they would charge us $15. And I would get my, at the time we started with four cars, I'd wash them two or three times a day. Think about how much that yeah. uh, in a day's business, it was a big percentage of our rental revenue. Mm. So I identified a car wash that wasn't doing well, approached the people that owned it uh, who were based in Los Angeles and struck a deal to buy the car wash. Now we could roll our limos through anytime we wanted. Cause I mean, it recirculates the water. There's no added cost. Yeah. The, the water, the guys on the line and the dryers, we were already paying them. We were doing a couple of hundred cars a day. So to roll my limos through, limos through was a no brainer. So my cars were always spotless. My wow. chauffeur being tuxedoed could go to the multiple tavern locations we had around town, wherever their pickup was near. And, and we kept bottled water and, and champagne at the bar. They could fill the ice chest from my ice machines, yeah. which felt 500 pounds of ice. So to get a couple of shovelfuls of ice and fill the limos, yet another no-brainer. But it was wow. a big deal in my competition, you know, going to the 7-Eleven to buy ice. They never did it. So the cars, their cars showed up with empty ice chests. What's that going to do for the customer? Yeah. So wow. we just raised the bar a little bit by offering services and a quality of service and vehicle mm -hmm. and driver that was un unseen in Las Vegas. And Presidential became incredibly popular and successful so much so my competition bought me out and gave me the chance to build my own taverns mm -hmm. in the vision dan and i had and and pursue gaming which is where big money really was mm -hmm. so one of the things first off that's an amazing ecosystem um and the way and and i know is brick by brick i know when you didn't when you bought that first you know that first tavern or as you kind of each piece that you build you were solving a problem for you for the community figuring out like that's genius who would you bought a car wash because you're like we're spending way too much on this can i get <laughs> can i make money from that piece take take that off of uh, of what we're spending have a better quality service and like turn maybe turn the car wash around and make it more profitable than it was all in the same so create an asset out of something else and kind of oh. compound it so adam, so adam think, think about the the customers that were driving on one of the most traveled streets of Las Vegas would see the car wash as as cars drove in, drove yeah. out and got dried and they're seeing stretch limos. That's the conclusion really is that must be a great car wash. I'm going to start using it. If the limos are using it, I mean, they don't know the owner of the car wash is the owner of the limo service, but they're thinking. Oh, if that's true. So you see, it, I would do the same thing. You see. Yeah. So we <laughs> grew our business from using our business. Oh, man, that's a great story. Um, one of the things you wrote about that I want to make sure that um, that that we highlight is um, finding the right people. So that was one of the stories and one of the things that you wrote about in the book. Like maybe give us a little bit of comments on what finding the right people has made it meant in your career. Sure. When you have a business and you're going to hire your employees, mm -hmm. you need to put yourself in your customer's shoes. What are they looking for? Some businesses you need a certain skill set. Some businesses, even more than the skill set, you need a certain look. Mm -hmm. So while it sounds like a no-brainer, I wanted to hire attractive young female bartenders. Mm -hmm. Anybody could make a scotch and soda, yeah. but what was going to drive business into my place? Mm -hmm. No offense to male bartenders, yeah. but yeah. most bar goers are male. And, and if I had attractive young female bartenders, mm -hmm. I would drive more traffic to me. When I did a TV commercial, I, I mm -hmm. featured 
the dozen or so barmaids I had and cocktail waitresses. Mm -hmm. They were gorgeous and personable. And it drove traffic to our taverns as opposed, there's a tavern on every corner, if not more than one in this mm -hmm. town. So why are they going to come to me and not somewhere else? Not only is logistics important, people yeah, want to yeah. drink close to home so they don't have to drive a great distance. Mm -hmm. But but the attractive barmaids and servers was critical to having good food, mm -hmm. keep your place clean. You know, I most bar owners didn't didn't hire a janitor. I had I hired a guy to come in every morning and every night, clean the floor, vacuum, service mm -hmm. the restrooms. You'd go in a bar, you you'd swear the the restroom, the owner hadn't looked at it in a week. Yeah. And I don't want to describe in detail the filth and, and the, 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 the odor, but mm. my, my restrooms were like a surgical center. Yeah. And I was a fanatic about that. So, I mean, I would go through my bars when I had four of them with a white glove test. We'd have an inspection once a week. My yeah. managers would follow me and I'd walk through the place and they'd, they'd say, oh, it's Wednesday morning. Ron's going to do the inspection. And they'd make <laughs> sure, you know, that everything was clean and you know, every once in a while, you throw a curve at them. When yeah, yeah. when they check the bins that hold all the silverware, and I'd pull all the forks and spoons out and look at the bottom, make mm -hmm. sure it was dust-free and clean. Well, then they didn't expect me to go through and run my hand along the base of the booth in the dining room where the seat back meets the seat bench. Yeah. And here's a French fry. What the hell is this? <laughs> what are you guys doing when you come in in the morning? So they never knew where I was going to look. So that would make them do a better job. And that's the goal is to get your people to do mm. a better job. So back mm. to your question, to find the right people. You interview yeah. them yourself. You don't delegate that to your to your managers. And you get a feel for the person you're interviewing. You ask them questions about their past jobs. Through the questions that they didn't know were coming and how they answer them, you, you get a feel for what's important to them. What did they think about on their last three jobs when they got to work? What was the first thing they did? And, yeah. and you, you hire the right people so that they will run the place the way you would if you could be on all three shifts a day and in four locations at the same time. If you could embody yourself and every person at every position, that's the best employee you're going to get when you're a hands-on, observation-driven owner so that's what I would keep in mind when I interviewed potential employees and hire the people that I thought were my kind of people. Mm. And then when I'm not there, I hired a service. They're called shoppers or spotters. They come in, they look like a customer. They might be a husband and wife team. It might be an older person with what looks like to be their, their adult child mm -hmm. for a meal and a couple of drinks. And then they would write a report about what they encountered in their one hour visit the quality mm. of the service, the quality of the food, the condition of the restrooms, everything they observed. And then I would have a meeting and my people didn't know they had been shopped. You yeah. know, they, hundreds of customers a day. They don't know two of them were shoppers. So every, every six months or so, we'd have an employee meeting. It wasn't more frequent because with three shifts running seven days a week, yeah. every yeah. time you have a meeting, you're taking up someone's sleep time. Someone sure. who worked another shift is having to stay awake for this meeting. So I yeah, didn't do yeah. it as often as I would have liked, but I got my team together and I would share copies of the spotter report with them. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, see what the spotters found? When you walk into the bar, before you relieve your, your off-going bartender, walk around, look at, look at these things. I would say that to my managers and I would say that to my bartenders. Mm -hmm. And when you can motivate them to catch the things before the owner catches them, yeah. And risk yeah. their job for not doing what you ordered them to do. Yeah. Um, you motivate them to do a better job and you end up having a better run operation, yeah. better yeah. trained employees, and a better customer experience. And what does that mean? Your customers come back more often. Mm. Wow. And uh and I think so. I think you had Yelp before Yelp was invented, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never looked at it that way. You had Yelp before Yelp was invented, like, and yeah. now they had. There's so many eyeballs and everything else on. Yeah, you were you were pioneering quite a few things and processes that other things are built off of. Through the years. Yeah, that's very observant, Adam. I don't disagree with you. I, <laughs> I I think running any business, not taverns, not just yeah, of course businesses, you need to identify things, pursue the the cure and then reach a conclusion. 
Mm. When when you you know you you could tell your managers, I saw this, this, and this, fix it. That's yeah. not reaching a conclusion. Your managers may not do it any better than your bartenders or your servers did. Mm. You need to go check things yourself. And yeah. that's a hands-on employer who will have a more successful business because they've trained their people, even their key people better. Yeah. It's awesome. Ron, I want to spend some, so I know we've done some work and um, talking about tenacity in some of our previous interviews, but I'm always curious, um, like what, and I'm sure there's lots of things that may not have made the cut, right? Because whenever you're putting together a book in general, um, or in general, um, especially in autobiography, um, things aren't going to make the cut, only so many pages that you can put in it. But I'm just curious if there's anything that didn't make the cut that I can get out of you today that you were like a story or it could be other things things like um, that for, for the tenacity book that maybe were around that you want to, you kind of want to document because I'm always interested to pick your brain here. <laughs> well, when, when you identify a problem, hmm. and I didn't want to put things in a book that might implicate me in wrongdoing, but of course. <laughs> uh, to be candid now, uh, I'm comfortable speaking about uh, in the limousine business, there was a very aggressive general manager Hmm. Uh, of one of my competitors and to do away with me as a competitor he had some of his friends essentially total one of my limos you know wow. they, they, i couldn't afford to put them in garages my driver my drivers took them home <laughs> because we were a 24-hour service if i got a call at two in the morning i'd contact the driver and the car was in front of his house for him to go pick up the client yeah so when i identified who was at the bottom of this I needed to stake out the problem and solve it so it didn't happen again. Because even if you're insured, you know, $5,000 deductible, it's costing you $5,000 to fix $15,000 in damage to a $60,000 limo. Yeah. So in one case, I was able to narrow down this gentleman's location yeah. in an elevator that I had determined had no perimeter cameras. Whatever, and if no one else was in it, it was yeah. just him and me. And an old Marine Corps hold was grabbing the Adam's apple on both sides. Yeah. And you have inescapable cooperation from yeah. the recipient of that hold. Yeah. So pinning him against the wall of an elevator and making him wonder if he was going to take another breath with this level of squeeze I put on that yeah. hold and looking him in the eye and telling him, if one more limo gets damaged, mm. like the one you did on such and such a street, mm. this is going to be the best experience you have with me. Yeah. And I know you're having trouble swallowing and breathing, yeah. but trust me, it will get worse. Yeah. Never again touch one of my cars. Mm. Sometimes, I know that's against the law, and I'm admitting to it, but the statute of limitations has run out. Yeah. But that's one example. There was a city councilman who used his power as a councilman to try to throw me in jail because I dared to want to open a casino in his city where he was a competitor in the in, in one of my businesses mm -hmm. and he had plans to open his own gaming properties. Wow. So in this small town adjacent to Las Vegas, he has his police uh, department pursue me on a bogus claim and I could prove it was bogus. I'm not just a wrongdoer claiming it wasn't yeah. me. But I had someone go undercover. And through what we learned through this undercover operation, mm -hmm. we learned that he targeted me and said to someone, I don't care what you do. Point the finger at Corey and you'll get away with this crime you committed. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so being candid with him that I had the goods on him and could ruin his life. Yeah. He came after me one more time because I wasn't doing anything wrong. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to open a casino in the city that he, he didn't want me to be in. It's a competition. Yeah. And yeah. So being candid with people and making sure they realize, you know, more than they thought you knew, like hmm. before there was Google, before there, there, there was a way to research my investigator would would quickly find someone's home address yeah. or the addresses of some of their investment properties which was not public information at the time mm -hmm. now you can do a google search 
run their name and see a list of properties on the assessor's parcel map that they own. Yeah. But when yeah. you would tell someone in in the uh, in the early '80s mm -hmm. where they live and where their rental property is, mm -hmm. you you shake them up. <laughs> and if you're not doing it for bad reasons and you're just yeah. trying to get them to leave you alone, I'm okay with that kind yeah, of a threat. Yeah. yeah. So this detective found it better to just leave me alone than to continue pursuing me. Mm -hmm. And we were able to operate our tavern at a higher level, not be harassed. And I was working towards building them up and selling them mm -hmm. for the next flip. Not if I was going to keep getting harassed or my customers mm -hmm. would keep getting pulled over every time they pulled out of my bar or he would keep a running patrol car in my parking lot where people oh, were afraid wow. to come in and have a drink. Wow. So uh, getting people to back off when they're messing with you and finding the way, the right way mm -hmm. to approach them and come up with something that matters to them to get them to leave you alone became a bit of a mission. And finding a very good private investigator who is a mm -hmm. retired police detective enabled me to find out things I needed to find out that I couldn't on my own yeah, and use yeah. that information to overcome challenges and obstacles. Yeah. I, yeah. That, it's interesting here. You tell these stories, Ron, because sometimes I forget because, uh, you know, again, when you, when you read your book, which I, I recommend everybody pick up a copy of tenacity and you're going to hear story upon story. If you hear, you think what Ron was just sharing is, is interesting. You're, it, it doesn't stop like, especially the audio book as well. Um, one that I listened to, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. The acting's great. Of course it's delivered right. And it's entertaining, but Ron's life just, just to be candid, if you think Think about like that time period you're documenting really the growth of vegas a lot of other things and you're in some pretty uh not let's just say not the whitest glove business even though you are wearing white gloves <laughs> looking for french fries and whatever else so you turned some businesses that weren't white glove into white glove i should say because i didn't know that story either because you're well, as you're you know making sure everything's immaculate in your tavern so that's why one of the I, i'm so passionate about tenacity of the book because you're documenting a lot of things but the less lessons for entrepreneurs, for business owners, for people out there that are like, eh, maybe, well, well, I'm not in the hospitality space. They're in, it's not just hospitality. When we look at um, some of the themes that Ron is, is, is writing about, it applies in, in all businesses, really. And it's really what it takes to, to succeed. It doesn't matter what, what niche you're in or what type of business, in my opinion. Um, well, it's critical. It's critical for your viewers and listeners yeah. to get that things of value do not come effortlessly. If it's a value, it's going to take something to make it happen. And do not be scared off by the obstacles that are going to be unavoidable. Embrace them. Find a way through them or around them. And, and when you overcome those challenges, you will find unforeseen success in your life. It's awesome. Great words, Ron. And um, that being said, um, if somebody is, um, well, no, let me, let me start with this one. I mean, you're, I know you're, you're on promo. You got a lot of things going on and we're still, we're just ramping up on promoting the book that we just released with each other. Um, I mean, what's next? What's next for you? What's next for Tenacity? Well, before I forget, I want your listeners to know that my book and my life have a website where they could learn a lot more than we've shared today. There's a gallery that they could click a drop down box and look at old and new pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Dan in the Marine Corps, uh, my family. Yeah. So the, the website is Ron Corey, C O U R Y, author.com. Ron Corey, author.com. Great website, very well created and maintained. As we said, the audiobook by Dean Kane gives me something to keep marketing. And right now, my drive is to continue marketing the book because. Yeah. A lifetime went into it, two plus years into making it a book went into it. So I don't feel like I can ever really do justice to yeah, the job yeah. of putting out the word to either get a paper copy if you're going to be flying or download the audio by Dean Kane, yeah, Superman yeah. himself. What an honor to, to work with Dean and get him to record my book. Um, and, and I think people will learn a lot of life lessons about uh, determination, perseverance, and diligence to achieve things that they dreamt, uh, only dreamt were possible, but to realize that everything they dream about is possibly attainable. Yeah. You just have to find the roadmap to get there. Yeah. And it's not always money. Mm -hmm. It's 
great. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm excited to continue to help, um, promoting the book and, uh, we'll put that, we'll put that, um, the website into the show notes, of course. So Ron author.com so that our audience can just click on the, click on the link and head right on over and pick up a copy of course. Um, and speaking of the audience, so if this is your first time with Mission Matters or listening to an episode or engaging with the content, we're all about bringing on business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives and having them share their mission, the reason behind their mission, really what motivates them and what excites them about business so that we can all learn from that, right? So we all grow together. That's the whole point. We all want to grow together. Um, if that's the type of content that sounds interesting or fun or exciting to you, we welcome you. Hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission-based individuals coming up on the line, and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Ron, um, I know we're just getting started, man. It's been so much fun having you having you back on the show and get, getting some more stories out of you. So thanks again for coming on and making time for us. It's been my pleasure, Adam. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity.